So I walked into the court martial and this really sharp attorney, uh, Captain Abrams, was prosecuting me. And I sat down, he says, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Three hours later, I finished. I said, this is everything I have done. And then I looked at the captain, I'm on the stand, and he goes, I said, how many years will I be in jail? And he says, you're free, congratulations. Honorable discharge. And that saying, the truth shall set you free for me. And ever since then, I'd rather tell you up front than have you find out from somebody else while well, you got a court martial. What up, it's Mr. X to the Z exhibit. What's up, guys? It's Andy for selling. This is your boy, Frau Monk. This is Ryan Serhant. This is Shaney. Hi, it's Patrick McGibbon. It's Sonia Zarvitani. This is Director X. Hey, everybody, I'm Forbes Riley. Yo, this is Goldie. This is Amberly Lago. This is Chris Voss. Michael Francis here. Yo, this is Charlie Tuna. Hey, what's up? It's Billy Jean. And you're listening to the Run GPG podcast. Well, I'm going to go hang out and listen to David's next podcast from the Run GPG. You might hear something you like. Peace. Best known as the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the number one personal finance book of all time, Robert Kiyosaki has challenged and changed the way tens of millions of people around the world think about money. He's an entrepreneur, educator, and investor who believes the world needs more entrepreneurs. With perspectives on money and investing that often contradict conventional wisdom, Robert has earned an international reputation for straight talk, irreverence, and courage, and has become passionate and outspoken as an advocate for financial education. Robert, it's an honor. Welcome to the Run GPG podcast. Well, it's my honor, too. I, I love talking to young guys like you, you know, because <laughs> um, I'm now the old guy, so I like talking to younger guys. Well, you look great. You look great, Robert. As we were talking offline, um, the past year marked the 25th anniversary of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it's still the number one personal finance book of all time. Uh, when I was preparing, it looked like it has sold 44 million copies and counting. Unbelievable. So that's beyond impressive, Robert. And you know, you're obviously aware of the impact you've had on millions around the world. So uh, 25 years later, looking back, did you expect the book to become as popular as it did and still is? Or are you surprised at how iconic it's become? I, I am blown away. But the greatest joy of talking to young guys and young women is when people come up to me and say, my dad gave me your book or my teacher gave me your book. And that's probably the, my, I'm 75 years old. And that's the joy, mm -hmm. you know, that the book is handed down from generation to generation. Because as I said, we, why don't we teach money at school? That was my question when I was nine years old. I said, hey, when are we going to learn about money? Mm -hmm. And we still don't teach about money. And this is the worst part about it today. You know, let's get back to 2023. This whole thing about censorship and all this and why are people afraid of speaking up is a lot of people, like this COVID thing, a lot of doctors wouldn't say anything because they would lose their job. And so when you look at what happens when you're afraid of losing your job, you kind of lose your freedom, your freedom of speech. You can get censored, you know, people can push you around and all this. So for me personally, my poor dad, who's a great guy, he ran for lieutenant governor of the state of Hawaii because Hawaii is one of the most corrupt states in the union. And um, he ran against his boss, the governor. And the moment my dad, poor dad, declared he was going to run for lieutenant governor as a Republican, which proves how stupid he was in Hawaii because he should have he registered as a communist. He had been a lot better in Hawaii. But anyway, his friends left him. Mm. His best friends left him and said, look, we can't go with you because if we endorse you, we'll lose our jobs. So at that time, I was a U.S. Marine. I was in flight school in Florida, getting ready to go to Vietnam. And my dad, what crushed him was his best friends left him. They couldn't support him, even though they knew the governor and the whole state of Hawaii was corrupt, but they had, they're had they so afraid of losing their jobs. And so that kind of rung in my head. How many people today are their lives dictated to the fear of losing their job or their pension, as the case may be? 
Yeah, it, it's strange times we live in, Robert. It really is. And, you know, hosting a show and, you know, I run a business, well, it's international now, but, you know, we talk to people from all walks of life, many different industries, entrepreneurs, business builders, of course, but also, you know, like hip hop legends and and uh, musicians and creatives. And it's surprising how often they either mention the book or the concepts in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Are you aware of how culturally significant the book has become 25 years later. And what's the most common remark you hear about maybe yourself and the book? Well, again, it's to me, I didn't, I flunked out of high school twice because I can't write. Imagine that. I flunked my sophomore year and my senior year. And if you see my Ferrari, the license plate says 1.9 GPA. <laughs> if you met me when I was 18 years old, you said, someday this guy's going to write the number one book in personal finance and history. You would say, there's not a prayer in hell. This guy can do that. My head was so far up my butt, <laughs> you know, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't drink the Kool-Aid, if you know what I mean. Yeah, contrarian. Does yeah. Does your generation use that term, drink the Kool-Aid? Yeah, absolutely. I still use it. I just well, couldn't drink it. <laughs> I like it. I love that license plate. That's amazing. Yeah. Here we are today, you know, with all you've accomplished and become known for. Uh, we recently had your friend and colleague, Tom Wheelwright, on the show. And when asked about working with you, you know, he said he keeps things simple and understandable. Robert is the best financial educator in the world. So, so interesting to think about. I, I think a lot would agree with that. You know, you, you've got the books, uh, the seminars, keynotes, interviews like this one, and of course, your show. But I also wonder, uh, was that something you set out to do intentionally or was that organic? Like how and when did you realize your purpose and what your legacy would eventually be known for? I, it's, I tell you what, this was not planned at all. You know, at, um, mm. like, like most people, I had no idea. I, I was a surfer kid growing up in Hawaii. I was flunking out of school. My poor dad was the head of education, you know, Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern. He did all the right things. He was the head of education, straight A student. And when I was 16, he said to me, I'm not going to pay for your college education because you'll just waste it. I'm not a student. And so that might have been the best thing because a lot of times we coddle our kids. You know, we give them everything, give everybody a trophy. And poor dad says, you're really incompetent. And my rich dad, who was my best friend's father, says, he's right. So I kind of had to figure out my own way from there. And how was I going to get through school? You know, education is still important, but what do you learn is important more. So I really wanted to drive ships. You know, I, I read stories of merchant ships and whaling ships and traveling the world and, you know, going to Tahiti. You know, I watched Marlon Brando and Mutiny on the Bounty. And mm -hmm. So I went to school to be a ship's officer and I was fascinated by oil. Why? I don't know. Just kind of inside of me. So I sailed for Standard Oil of California, but the Vietnam War was still on. This is in 69. And I volunteered for the U.S. Marine Corps. So I gave up. Back then, I wasn't making this much money. My, my classmates in 1969 were making 120000 a year. That's a lot of money back then. So we were the highest paid graduates in the world. I'm sailing for Standard Oil, making about 48000 a year in 69. And I gave it up, become a lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps, 200 a month. Hmm. We go to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. And then straight to Vietnam, Camp Pendleton, straight to Vietnam. So did I plan all that? No. Am I glad I did it? Yes. But when I was in Vietnam, I, I realized something horrible. I said, our country lies to us. You know, here I am, red, white, and blue. If you call me a traitor, I'll kill you. But I realized we were being lied to. We had this guy, Robert McNamara and Nixon and Lyndon Johnson. And then I'd watch Walter Cronkite on television. I was a pilot, so we were calling in airstrikes and flying. And I could see the battle from the air and all this. And we were losing the war back then. This is 72, 73. And what Walter Cronkite reported wasn't the news. It was fake. And I'll tell you something turned my stomach, you know, because here I am, red, white, and blue, God bless America, U.S. Marine. It saddened me to no end. It just saddened me. I said, why are we lying to us? And um, But the good news, something else good happens. So as the North Vietnamese were running across the DMZ, the militarized zone, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. And I said, Jesus, what's gold? You know, what's gold? So in, in 1972, I went looking for this stuff here. That's a real gold coin. I said, why did he take the dollar off the gold standard? And the reason the balloon hangs back there, that's the U.S. economy. The real little basket floating on this hot air balloon of debt, you know. So the reason Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard was to get the whole economy to float on fake 
fake money, fake media, exactly everything my friend Trump says, you know, it's fake news, fake money, everything's fake today. So here I am, a Marine lieutenant in Vietnam going, we have fake money. And the North Vietnamese were overrunning us. And so Marines aren't the brightest guys in the, on the box. I said, well, let's go buy some gold. And this is in 72. And I said, well, the only, the only trouble is the gold mines behind enemy lines. Again, Marines aren't the brightest. I said, no problem. We'll go in really quickly. We'll get out quickly. So we flew behind enemy lines to buy gold. And I was negotiating for that one little coin, and the woman wouldn't budge. I thought she was, I thought she would discount it from 50 bucks to 40 bucks because she was behind enemy lines. And she wouldn't budge. Look, she had little red teeth, you know, a little Vietnamese woman. So oh, spot, 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 hell spot, you know. There's two college graduates like you and I standing there, and she's educating us about what money really is. This is in Vietnam. Now in enemy territory, I said, I'm getting, I'm getting schooled right now. And that's when I became a gold bug because that little gold coin, I paid 50 bucks for it eventually in Hong Kong. Today is worth 2000. And the reason the gold coin was 50 bucks in 1972 and it's 2000 today is because they just keep pumping more money into the economy. So our money is fake. <laughs> long, long answer. Yeah, no, but I, I, I love it. You brought it up and I, I'm, I'm glad you did. You, you mentioned the balloon in the back there. And, and that was the other reason I was looking forward to having you on the show oh, wow. is because of the, the timing. You know, I can't think of a more relevant time in human history to discuss your views on what we call the current state of the union, right? And, uh, you know, where we are in history, it's an uncertain, it's a shaky global economy. Uh, some say we're on the, the brink of a world economic collapse, you know, so there's a lot of things happening right now. You know, we've got the uh, the rapid devaluation of currencies, as you're referencing, uh, inflation, interest rate issues, along with stocks and cryptocurrencies, you know, taking a punch. Uh, however, uh, none of this is surprising for, you know, thought leaders like yourself and history books, including Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because they do talk about how great civilizations collapse when, when the gap between the haves and the have-nots grow too big. And some would argue that we have actually crossed that Rubicon. We're almost there, if not there already. So in your opinion, are we on the brink of collapse? Well, we're getting closer if we're not. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I think, you know, there was Lehman Brothers in 2008. You're probably too, too young to remember that one. But I was on CNN calling that Lehman Brother was going to go down. So you can check Wolf Blitzer and me and all that. I was calling it going down. The baby boom generation, I could give some history because history tells you what happened. In 71, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Then 74, my generation, the boomer generation, we went from a defined benefit pension plan to a defined contribution. Today, it's known as a 401k. And what's going to happen, you know, as they keep raising interest rates today, the stock market keeps coming down. So that means my generation, the boomer generation, we had it the easiest. Of any generation in history, our generation had these. You see, we bought a house, went from 50000 to 200000 I mean, the stock market, it went up. So the boomers are toast. That's my generation. And you guys are going to have to pick up the bill. There's one more thing that's going to go, which is Social Security. So that hot air balloon sitting behind there with a little gondola underneath of it is you and me hanging under this balloon. There's a reason I have it there. And that's why, you know, this here is real silver. I only buy what's real. I don't buy SLV or GLD. I don't buy paper. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. But when I when when I when that little woman in Vietnam, I'm I'm hiding behind enemy lines trying to negotiate a ten dollar discount on an ounce of gold, and she's educating me. I'm going, how much don't we know? And you look at what they're teaching our schools today. I mean, why? You know what pisses me off? I mean, when they teach America is systemically racist. That is the biggest lie I've ever heard. I mean, I know those racists. There's isolated cases of racists. And my family was locked up during World War II because of Pearl Harbor. So we've experienced racism. But as a general rule, Americans are great people. Most people are great people all over the world. So to be pumping racism and then gender bending, you know, where they're asking boys to become girls at age five. I'm going, holy mackerel. But how do you know at five whether I should be a boy or a girl? I mean, what the hell are they teaching these kids? Yeah, I'm going, what the hell? You know, how can they teach us that stuff? It, it looks like there's some sort of agenda, obviously. Uh, there's something weird happening with this. I, 
and, and the, the fact that it's ramped up so fast in the last few years is shocking, but many would agree with you. So, you know, we're talking about it here, but nobody knows what's happening next. I mean, you're talking about uh, pensions, but if you had to guess what's next, uh, recession, or uh, I guess the question is what keeps you awake at night? Well, I, what keeps me awake and that keeps me active, you know, like I, I call it the five G's as number one, you have to have gold or silver and, and real stuff, not paper, no paper. Okay. This is real silver. They have real gold. And then you have ground or real estate. You have gasoline. So I invest in oil. So I have oil wells in North Dakota, uh, Louisiana, and Texas. I don't have paper gold. I mean, paper oil. I don't have stocks at Exxon, IBM. I mean, Standard Oil. So you have gas and you have grub or food. So I invest in Wagyu cattle. And cattle are wonderful because Wagyu is a Japanese brand. But I get paid for the sperm count. So I've always I've always wanted to be a breeding bull, but now I, I kind of own them. <laughs> and so every time they inseminate another cow, I get richer. You know, anything you can't print, you can't print sperm. You know, I mean, or semen or whatever it is. And, and then the last thing is a gun. You know, I, I have guns everywhere because I'm a U.S. Marine. You know, I've already had people try and kill me enough times. So it's a five G's, you know, and, and that's that's how I operate. We're <laughs> dangerous. I hate to say this. Not that anything bad's going to happen. But if it happens, are you prepared? Yeah. So, and, yeah. and many would agree with you. I uh, was not expecting that answer, though, Robert. But yeah. the uh, the bulls. Yeah. <laughs> the bulls? <laughs> <laughs> That's a sound bite. So will the dollar collapse? And if so, are we going back to a gold standard? Well, no, that's what do you see? The possibilities are getting closer every day. I'm not saying it will. Also, in 1918, the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, they started printing money, and that led to the collapse of the German Reichsmark, and that led to the rise of Adolf Hitler. If this economy gets much worse and the dollar collapses and people start panicking, look at China's coming on, Russia's coming on, the BRICS nations, you know, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. South Africa coming on and the dollar is getting weaker. If they collapse the dollar, it's going to come washing back onto our shores. And then we're going to have another event that brought to power Adolf Hitler. It's the collapse of the, back then it was the Reichsmark. If, I'm not saying we will, if we collapse the dollar, another Hitler will arise. And it definitely is not Joe Biden. That guy can't even find his way to the toilet. But anyway, I'm not Republican or Democrat. <laughs> Trump is my good friend. We wrote two books together. I, I'm going to ask you specifically about Trump in a minute here. Um, yeah. uh, but but again, talking about you know relevancy and and timing, it's been an emotional few years uh, for almost everyone. It's been a roller coaster of uncertainty, as we know, and it looks like we're in for more of the same in the short term, at least anyway. So it might be difficult for those who aren't paying attention uh, to take emotion out of major financial decisions. And of course, you know, in Rich Dad, you do talk about the mistake of using emotions to think and drive decisions. So it has been difficult, as we mentioned, uh, for many these days, because when emotions go up, as we know, intelligence goes down. Right. So the question is, how does someone take emotion out of financial decisions? Like, what do they need to be thinking about in order to make wise decisions in a volatile environment. Okay, so let me just say something, you know, is this here is a US quarter. It's a pre-64 quarter. It was the reason it's pre-64, that was when if you look at the quarter, it's real silver. So the reason so many people are emotional is because it's our money is fake. Okay, we have fake money, fake news, fake political leaders. And so when I was in Vietnam, the reason I flew behind the enemy lines and said, I better get some real money because that comment that, that bastard Nixon, you know, he took the dollar off the gold standard, opened the doors to China. And here I'm a U.S. Marine fighting for freedom. And this guy is selling us down the tubes. So the first thing I say to people is get some real money. So get some silver. You know, this here is a real silver quarter 
you can probably buy it for a buck. Everybody in the world can afford a buck. And all I started to do was acquiring real money. So I have real silver, real gold. I have Bitcoin. You know, I'm going after what's real. You know, when I watch my Wagyu cattle having sex, I'm getting richer. <laughs> The, the, Fed cannot, the Fed and the Treasury cannot interfere between the bull and the cow. <laughs> Again, a surprising answer from uh, one of the best-selling authors of all time, Robert Kiyosaki. And speaking of, you know, you know, the controlling emotions of fear and guilt, you know, we hear the phrases, uh, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out, and the new yeah. one, FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that is especially yeah. too when it comes to you know, investing, especially in cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin markets. You talked about Bitcoin. Where are you right now, first quarter of 2023, regarding the current state of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? Are you bullish on Bitcoin or any cryptocurrencies? And what are your short-term and long-term predictions for Bitcoin? Well, I think it's more your generation, not mine, you know, because I'm, I'm a Technosaurus Rex. I can barely use a cell phone. But years and years ago, I was a student of a man named Buckminster Fuller. This is him here. This is his last book, Cosmography. And he was watching kids play video games. And he saw them using crypto as money. And he says, that's the future. When he said that it was possible, I listened to him. And so when I saw Bitcoin, up, and I watched it go to 20,000, then it retreated down to like 1,000. I said, if it doesn't blip, and then it, it got back to six. When it retraced back to six, it's going to hang on. And so as you know, it's gone up and down and up and down. This guy, SBF, Sam Beckman. I'm not saying it's going to hang around, but I think Bitcoin has a place. And it's the anti-Fed, it's the anti-Treasury, which fits my personality. Because as I said, when I was in Vietnam, I said, this is fake news. You know, we're getting lied to. And I didn't trust our money. And if you trust our money, fine, keep saving the US dollar. But our national debt is now 31 trillion. And look at it this way. And they're trying to figure out they're going to open the budget. This is as we speak today. So let's say they raise interest rates to 5% on $31 trillion. That means the taxes we have to co collect are 1.5 trillion, mm. 1.5 trillion. And that goes before we pay for the Army, Air Force, social welfare programs, all this stuff. Somebody is robbing us dry via our debt. And so that's why my friend Trump came in. I know people hate his guts, he's, he's a good man. He was trying to get everything back into the box. But as you know, there's people in the deep state who don't want him to do that. And today, as we're talking, they're talking about actually balancing a budget. Oh, my God, what a wonderful idea. You know, if you and I just spent as much as we wanted to spend, we'd be in jail. Mm -hmm. But our government doesn't. So all I'm saying here is, for most people, look for what's real in money. Mm -hmm. Like this is a U.S. quarter pre-1964 when it was real silver. And Johnson, President Johnson came on air back then. He said, real silver is too valuable for money. And so it shifted from silver to copper. And the US dollar went from a silver certificate. Today, you read it as Federal Reserve note. It's basically an IOU. So our whole monetary system is based on debt. That's why you hear me say there's good debt and bad debt, where guys like Dave Ramsey says, live debt free. And that's good advice for most people. I took the opposite route. Since debt became money in 1971, I borrow my ass off. So my friends and I have become billionaires using debt. But that's like handling a handgun. You better be pretty good with debt, you know? Yeah. Because you, you make a mistake, the, the, the debt will kill you, the gun will kill you. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's challenging traditional thought right? Yes. On what's what's valuable and what's not. So I think that's really interesting. You know, taking a look at the, the real estate market itself, you know, over the last few years, if you owned a home, it may have seemed like you won the lottery with the, you know, incredible valuation. Some called it a bubble, some called it a bubble. Uh, now we're seeing a, a major downward movement and uh, adjustment in pricing, especially in major metropolitan areas. Uh, however, based on your principles of cash flow, it looks like the concepts you teach regarding you know, properties and cash flow, they're recession proof or market proof because the demand for rent and rentals has gone up. So what are your thoughts, broad stroke thoughts, I guess, on what we've seen in the real estate market over the last few years and now post pandemic, what are your short-term, maybe long-term 
predictions for the real estate market? Well, real estate is regional, it's not international. So mm -hmm. you could have a hot area, a bad area, whereas stocks would be hot across the world or not hot across the world. And that's that balloon back there is hanging on this balloon of debt. That, that's, that's what's happening to it. So with real estate, you've really got to know what's going on in your area more than anything else. And I've been caught, you know, I've, I've lost money, um, made some bad purchases and all that, but the market always came back. My concern this time is it might not come back. So I could get caught, but thank God I've got a lot of Bitcoin and a lot of gold and silver to cover my mistakes. But if you're what, what I call the, in the Marine Corps, they were called FNGs. And if you jumped into real estate, just because everybody else was getting rich two years ago, you might be the FNG, you know, and, and we all get caught. So the problem I have with academics and school teachers is they tell you not to make mistakes, but how do you learn if you don't make mistakes? You know, how does a baby learn to walk unless they fall down? Yeah. So for the young people, I said, look, you know, be willing to make mistakes. Just don't lie about them. Mm -hmm. You make a mistake, say, hey, I effed up. I screw it up. How do I pay you back? What can I do? But this guy, you know, SBF, Sam Beckman, fraud and all that, he's trying to cover it up and all this. And Mr. Wonderful's not saying anything. I'm going, why don't you guys admit it? You know, Tom Brady, I don't know how much he lost. But they all got caught. It's not Bitcoin. It's fraud. Mm -hmm. There is a difference. That's like saying, you know, I lost a million dollars on a gold mine. Well, was it the gold mine or you got cheated? And as for young people, you know, I just say this would be willing to tell the truth. I, I, I screwed up. What's the price? Let me pay it back. I've paid back many mistakes. Yeah, it's great advice. Great advice, Robert. Um, you know, I, I did want to ask you about this too, because right now the thought of actual home ownership for many seems like an impossibility for a lot, right? Uh, in your work, you do talk about the, you know, the hypnosis of the system designed to enslave those who aren't financially literate, you know, go to school, get a job, get out of debt, uh, save money, pay taxes. All that being said, oh, wait, add, add 401k to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Add that to it as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all that being said is the classic definition of the American dream dead. Now, there's going to be more opportunity now than ever before. I think we're going into a depression. Now, my thing is, I remember some of my other books, I, and I, went, I flunked out of Sunday school also. I flunked everything. <laughs> I went to a good school. I, I had nominations to Naval Academy and Merch Marine Academy, and I went to Merch Marine Academy. So I, I, you know, I did do well in school. I mean, I, fl I'm, I flunked out of school, but I still graduated. But in Sunday school, one of the most important lessons I learned was that my Sunday school teacher asked our class, I'm seven years old, she goes, why were the wise men wise? And um, I raised my hand, I said, because they were rich. And she says, why do you say they were rich? I said, well, they came with frankincense, gold, and myrrh. I didn't know what frankincense and myrrh were, but I knew what gold was. And she goes, that's not the answer. I said, well, why were they rich? She says, they were always seeking the best teacher. So I'm not Christian, I'm not pumping religion and all this. But the beauty of what you and I are doing right now is your people listening to you have access to some of the best teachers in the world. So, you know, you've got to, when you go on YouTube or whatever you guys do today, you know, you've got to ask, if, is this teacher for real or is he fake? And if, if you follow some of my podcasts, I've been known to get into fist fights almost with these so-called gurus, especially in real estate. I won't mention their names. But well, they, why don't I mention it? Because uh, we just had Grant Cardone on the show. How'd it go with Grant? Well, I, I got into it with him. I wouldn't do what he says to do. It's the same as Dave Ramsey. You know, I mean, I respect Dave Ramsey because his formula does work. But what Grant was, what Grant Cardone was saying, in my opinion, was high risk. It was you didn't you don't need to take that much of a risk. So there's a difference between real estate and let's say a stock. The word is called liquidity. So if I buy a bad piece of real estate, it's not liquid. I can't get out of it. You know, it'll, it'll take you down like the Titanic. But if I buy, let's say, Tesla stock and I don't like it, I can sell it that night. So I can cut my losses early. So the difference between real estate and stocks or bonds is liquidity. Mm -hmm. So I got it into a grant. I said, Jesus, you know, somebody does what you do. They get caught with that thing that's not liquid and it starts to go down. That person is going to go down with the Titanic. 
And I also get on, I get, I get into with Peter Schiff. Schiff's and I are good friends. And Harry Dent, you know, Harry Dent's always recommending treasury bonds. And I said, I wouldn't touch this stuff. So I'm not saying I'm right, but I will tell you what I will do and I won't do. Mm -hmm. And that's what all you young people look for a teacher that will tell you what they are doing, not what you should be doing. There's a very big difference. So if you think you should be in a 401k, then find a teacher who will tell you, get in a 401k. I wouldn't touch this stuff. You know, okay. that's, that's, that's like why goo cattle and semen, you know? <laughs> I'd rather have that than a 401k. <laughs> Well, there might be a, you know, there might be a uptick in, you know, people purchasing bull semen after the show. Uh, the, well, there's, there's an uptick in bull if you know what I'm yeah. talking about, too. So that's why be careful who you listen to on YouTube, including me and you. hundred percent, hundred percent, Robert. Uh, interesting breakdown. I, I, I think it's, you know, I've said it before, too, and, and you're referencing it. You can literally be mentored by anyone you want these days. Anyone. Yeah. you know, uh, because we have access now that we never had before. Um, uh, speaking about the real estate industry itself, you know, for sales professionals and, and brokers, I really loved your breakdown of the importance of being able to sell, right? You said sales equals income. And I think people in any service industry are going to have to sharpen their sales skills, especially as things get more difficult. So can you just touch on the importance of sales skills and why the ability to sell directly impacts your success? Well, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be able to sell. Okay, pure and simple. But you're going to be a librarian, you don't need the skill set. So when I talk to young entrepreneurs, I said, look, when I was getting out of the Marine Corps, my poor dad wanted me to go fly for United Airlines. And thank God I didn't, you know, because I was a Marine pilot. You don't want me flying your passenger liner for you. And so I asked my rich dad, I said, I want to be an entrepreneur like you. And it says, then you have to learn how to sell. And in my family, my poor dad's family, salesmen were scum. So you notice in most academic families. So when my rich dad said, you have to learn how to sell, I had to go against my family's values. You know, my mother says, why don't you become a doctor? Or why don't you become a lawyer? You know, then you don't have to sell. I said, well, that's true. But I want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want job security and all that stuff. And so that's why my rich dad prevailed, you know, I said, but tell me, how can I be an entrepreneur without selling? He says, you can't. So anyway, with, with most people, they don't know how to sell and sales does equal income. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be in real estate, it's going to be an interesting market. But for those who can sell, it's going to be a great market. Yeah, I but love you it. got to be able to sell. Yeah, such a good breakdown. And then, you know, for a lot of our listeners who are, you know, sales professionals, uh, real estate industry insiders, uh, when you say pay your brokers well, uh, that's music to the ears of many uh, who listen and, and listen to you, read your books. However, you also say that not all brokers are created equal. I agree with that. What advice do you have for real estate agents and brokers going forward in the current environment that will help them get paid well? Well, I think you have to dedicate your life to your profession. Most real estate people know nothing about real estate. I mean, it's, it's pretty sad, really. But the best deals I have have come from real estate professionals that I make partners. So for some reason, I get the deals first. I just don't understand why that happens. <laughs> yeah, shocker. <laughs> shocker, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> or I, I could hire the cheapest real estate agent who knows nothing and spend all my day riding around looking at four bedroom, three baths house, you know, and all that stuff. Yeah. I just don't, I don't have the time to waste. I'd rather deal with the best yeah. and make them partners. Mm -hmm. And, sp you know, speaking of entrepreneurship, you know, what's the biggest mistake you see entrepreneurs and business builders making? Well, there's tons of them, but I think the biggest one is when you don't admit you made a mistake, you know, because mistakes are how we learn. Like I said, a baby learns to walk by falling down. And if you lie about your mistakes, you waste a good mistake. And and that was one of the lessons I learned the hard way because, you know, I was, I was a U.S. Marine and all that, but I was also court-martialed twice. I'm not up for the Medal of Honor by any chance. <laughs> And the reason was I, I was an entrepreneur and I got caught. Like one of my first things I got caught at is I was flying women in my helicopter. 
The second time I got caught, I was flying women in my helicopter drunk. <laughs> Oh, wow. I, you know, I was going to say, well, why were you court-martialed if you feel like comfortable sharing? Again, unexpected. I wasn't expecting that answer. <laughs> I'm an open book. I mean, I'm, I'm, but those are the best things that ever happened to me. Yeah. You see, the first time I got away with it. So the second time I added to it and I decided to fly these women to a deserted island in the Hawaiian island chain. And when they opened up my helicopter, I landed back at the Marine Corps Air Base in Hawaii. The first thing that fell out were my beer cans and then I fell out. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I said, I've, and, I, and I could have got away with it again, but I said, own it, mm -hmm. just tell the truth. And so that's why you watch Jack Nicholson and a few good men, you know, you can't handle the truth. Do you know? So I yeah. said, I better, tell the, I better tell the truth. So I walked into the court martial and this really sharp attorney, uh, Captain Abrams, was prosecuting me. And I sat down. He says, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Three hours later, I finished. I said, this is everything I have done. And then I looked at the captain, I'm on the stand, and he goes, I said, how many years will I be in jail? And he says, you're free, congratulations, honorable discharge. And that's saying, the truth shall set you free for me. And ever since then, I'd rather tell you up front than have you find out from somebody else, well, you, got, you know, he got court-martialed. I'm actually proud of it today. Not too many Marines have been court-martialed. <laughs> Yeah, and walk free, but you learn from your mistakes, Robert, which is really interesting. I think that's, I think that's great advice. You know, always tell the truth, be honest. You know, be I honest. think that's yeah. Um, is it, you know, again, you know, staying on the topic of entrepreneurship, is there commonality that all successful entrepreneurs have? Uh, I really, it's, it's hard to tell. One thing I would say every entrepreneur has is my doctor, who's also he's a doctor of cardiology, he's a heart transplant guy but he's also a doctor of acupuncture. So he's Eastern West medicine. And he's very philosophical. He says, there's always a Judas. I said, what do you mean by that? He says, you'll always be screwed. You'll always have a Judas in your group. It's human nature. I, I don't know if you can or not, but I, I, I just wouldn't pretend that somebody wouldn't do that. Yeah. And so what my doctor was saying, like he's a doctor of heart transplant guy, also acupuncture, and he's into yoga and meditation and all that. And he goes, there's always a Judas. And I didn't know what he was saying for a while, but inside of us, there's also jealousy. You know, and I see somebody's more successful than me, I might get jealous, or somebody has a better looking girlfriend than me, I might get jealous. Well, that's the start of being a Judas, envy, you know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. Um, And, you know, what, speaking of entrepreneurship, I speak to entrepreneurs all the time. How much have you enjoyed watching what Elon Musk has been doing at Twitter. Oh, I love that guy, man. I wish I had his cojones, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, I don't know if Tesla stock is going down because the greenies are punishing him, yeah. but he took him on. I mean, don't censor us. He's not after the greenies. He's after censorship. Mm -hmm. I'm after censorship too, because U.S. Marines, we fought for one thing, freedom. Mm -hmm. And when you take away our freedom, I'll fight like a dog. And some people just roll over and, you know, let them pet your stomach and they say, screw you, take your freedom. But Elon Musk fought back. I have tremendous respect for that. Yeah, I agree. It's been fun to watch. Um, and before we get to your, you know, your current projects, what you're doing now, I have to ask about Trump uh, and his tax returns. I was recently a guest on Tom Wheelwright's Live where he went through uh, Trump's tax return line by line. It was pretty enlightening. Um, I don't know if you looked at what uh, was released. Uh, thoughts on on the current state of the Trump, you know, uh, brand? Look, there's one reason I'm in real estate, taxes. You see, in 1971, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, the dollar became a function of debt and taxes. So the dollar became debt, but it took taxes to pay off the debt. So in 1974, when I came back from Vietnam, and that was the same time that the 401k was installed and the pension, the pensions were installed, these things, who stole my pension. I could see the whole thing formulating. So the reason I took real estate is because real estate, I use debt and I, pay, I don't pay any taxes. So Trump and I have both shared, the reason we wrote two books together, this is one of them, 
is we use debt and taxes. Now, when he debated Hillary Clinton, she says, she says, you don't pay any taxes. And Trump says, that's because I'm smart. Now, he pissed off average America. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, the tax laws are written for people who invest in real estate and entrepreneurs. That's the, those, those are the laws. And Tom Wheelwright will explain that. Yeah. So every year, I have to look for new properties to buy. Because if I don't buy more real estate, then I'll pay taxes. So the whole capitalist system, and this is worldwide, not just America, the whole capitalist system is designed for entrepreneurs who start businesses and invest in real estate. That's the game. And pay no taxes. Taxes are an incentive. You know, what I mean by that, oh, that you're cheating. But if you donate, let's say, $1,000 to cancer, you got a tax break. Well, the same for real estate guys. If we, we invest money in real estate, we got a tax break. Mm -hmm. But you put your money in a 401k, you don't really get it. You, you get a fake tax break or you have a small business all by yourself. You pay the highest taxes. You know, if you go from employee to small business, you pay the highest taxes. So, so that's what's wrong with people. They don't know anything about taxes. You're going to be an entrepreneur. You better find out about debt and taxes pretty quickly. 100%. Um, what was it like working with Donald Trump? It was joyous. You know, I mean, uh, his sons and I are really good friends because we're, we're politically incorrect hunters. And Don Jr. and Eric and I and my friends have spent hours on this little deserted island in the Hawaiian ar archipelago. There's no running water, no toilets, nothing. And you get to know people pretty well when you're sitting there for five days and all you're doing is you're drinking bottled water and then the rest you have to catch. So you catch fish or we, we hunt something down. But those two young men are fine, fine young men. Unlike this guy, Hunter Biden, you know, we're, we're real hunters. Hunter Biden, he's that joke. He says, yeah, dad's pissed at me because he told me to clean out the garage. You know, then they found all those top secret papers that they busted Trump on at Mar-a-Lago. And Trump was president and Biden was vice president. Biden not, not allowed to have those top secret papers. And I know because when I was in the Marine Corps, I was the S2 officer. S2 officers are the top secret officers. So I know how to classify documents. So what Trump did was legal. What Biden did was illegal. And this guy, Hunter Biden, you see him with drugs and strange women or interesting women. You know, I mean, not that I blame the boy, but... Um, Anyway, as compared to Don Jr. and Eric Trump, he is a chip off the old block, Joe Biden. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. I, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, because you've been, uh, you work closely with them. So that's good. Um, and I would trash them, you know, I would trash them too if they were worth trashing. But uh, my experience of the two boys has been mm -hmm. fantastic. I just saw one of them. I saw Don Jr. two weeks ago. Mm, yeah. So. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you run in interesting circles, Robert. Uh, it's good to see. What do you want to tell the world about? where we are as a people, maybe a civilization, where the world economy is headed in the next few years, like maybe for entrepreneurs, what's the most important thing to focus on in the short term? Well, my biggest concern right now has been since for years is why don't we have financial education in our schools? You know, I read this book here in 1965. It's called The Communist Manifesto. So in 1965, I was 18 years old and I went to military school. And instead of studying, my economics teacher was a West Point graduate, B-17 pilot in World War II. And he had us read The Communist Manifesto. And he says, this is what's going to happen to America. It's coming true now. And communism infiltrates America via our education system. And that's why they're teaching, you know, gender identity. And, and let me tell you something. To say that America is systemically racist is the biggest lie I've ever heard because, you know, I'm, I'm Japanese. So I've been discriminated against. But 98% of Americans aren't that way. You know, I was called a white supremacist. And I went in to look at the mirror. So now I'm still Asian, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's shocking. Inter yeah, it's interesting. You know, it is it is strange times. Uh, so yeah. I always like to, you know, pick the brains of thought leaders like yourself. Um, what's been the biggest contributor to your success over the years? Are you a new real estate agent or thinking about getting a real estate license? If so, you're going to want to ask about the Greater Property Group's Agent Scholarship Program 
Why pay for the cost of the course yourself when the Greater Property Group will subsidize the cost for you? Make sure you reach out and get all the details on the Greater Property Group's Agent Scholarship Program. What's been the biggest contributor to your success over the years? I should say my wife, but I, <laughs> no, she's uh, having good, great partners, great friends. You know, when I when I, I was talking to this young young guy, so my son's friends, I said, "Do you respect your friends?" He goes, "No." I said, "Well, we we have, we have fun together." I said, "Do you respect them?" He goes, "No." I said, "I'll find you friends." Mm. You know, it's because my friends. I would say 80% of my friends are entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. you know, and my, my best friend, we started together in 1974. He was a Mormon missionary in Northern Ireland of all places. And, he, and when they asked him, what, what makes you think you can, we're applying for jobs at Xerox. He says, what makes you think you can sell? He goes, he looks at the, the uh, Xerox recruiter. He says, I have the highest conversion rate of Catholics to Mormonism in the history of the Mormon church. If I can sell Catholics Mormonism, I can sell a stupid Xerox copier. And so he and I became best friends. And uh, this is a tip I'll, I'll give people. He and I became best friends. He sold this business for $2 billion mm. in 2020. We both pushed each other to become millionaires than billionaires together. I was going to say, you know, no better salesman. Um, <laughs> that's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Do, do you have a daily routine now, Robert? Not really. I'm, I'm pretty, that's one of the things I'm not happy about is I, I don't have a routine. Mm -hmm. I kind of just work as it comes and I do, you know, I, I'm always working, but I don't have a really good routine except for going to the gym and stuff like that. But I'm I'm also I'm always studying. That's what I'm doing. I'm on YouTube constantly. Again, listening for the good and the bad, because there's always two sides to everything. How's your uh, How's your golf game these days? Uh, non-existent, non-existent. Non <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's a question. This makes you think. We always ask this of our guests. If you could have dinner with any three people in history, past or present, who would they be and why? That's a tough question. Yeah, I'm going to think about that for a while. You know, it'd probably be Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. because I don't know how that. I mean, he knew what he was getting into, and he still mm -hmm. did what he had to do. Mm -hmm. And and that's the true sign of a leader: is do you do what you know you have to do? And he probably knew he was going to be assassinated. You know, so I, I think that's the best. And like the thing I loved about the U.S. Marine Corps, they were carrier pilots. And we always flew with a crew, of, total crew of five, two pilots, two gunners, and one crew chief. And I'd go anywhere with those guys. And mm -hmm. it was the best feeling in the world. And the saddest, the hardest part was also when your crews don't come back. You know, you have your best, these guys are your best friends for a couple of years at least. And one day the aircraft doesn't come back. And then years later, I go to the Vietnam Wall and find their names on the wall. So there's an emptiness, there's a high and a low to it. So the highest moments were flying with some of the greatest young men I knew. And then the low is when they don't come back. But the good news is I got kicked out as a Marine Lieutenant, but my best friend became a Lieutenant General. And today he's a Congressman from Upper Michigan, General Jack Bergman. And he helped get McCartney into the speakership and all this. But when Jack and I were Marines together, he was in as much trouble as I was. And as he said to me, I said, Jack, how come I'm in trouble and you're not? He says, because you get caught and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> wise, wise man. Uh, wise yeah. man. The, the, uh, well, so, so Abraham those, Lincoln. Yeah. But those are the guys I hang out with in yeah. real life. You know I mean? They're mm -hmm. wise men. Yeah. They're very yeah. successful wise men. Yeah. Um, well, as they say, you are who you hang out with, right? So final question, Robert. Uh, we, we, we talked about legacy earlier and the fact that you're known as, you know, one of the best financial educators in the world. However, what do you personally want to be known for? Like when all is said and done, what does the Robert Kiyosaki legacy look like? What do you want to be known for? Gee, I don't, you know, I just, I don't even think about that. I just do what supports humanity and the environment. You know, I'm not an environmentalist, but I don't like what the greenies are doing. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because I have oil and all that stuff. I'll stand up to what I what I think is right or wrong. You know, if you cut off all this oil, which Biden did, you crush the poor and middle class. So one of the first acts that Biden did was he kicked out the Keystone XL pipeline. The price of oil, I was making oil at $30 a barrel because I don't own oil shares. I own the real oil in the ground. Mm -hmm. And oil went from $30 the next day to $130. So I should have been celebrating. I said, you know, I'm a rich man. I don't need the money, but I'm a rich man. But what Biden did when he cut off that Keystone XL pipeline, he crushed the poor and middle class. Mm -hmm. And I think that's his intention. I think they're trying to crush the poor and middle class via inflation and oil prices and all that, and no financial education in schools. Mm -hmm. So that's what I fight for. Money's always been easy for me. Not easy, but I like the game. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. But when they're crushing America or the free world or crushing poor people, I get very upset about that. Yeah, it's funny you brought up uh, the Keystone. We, we operate in Alberta, which is an oil province in, in Canada. Right. And the Keystone was, I mean, we had tens of thousands of people looking forward to that project, the yeah. jobs, what it was going to do to yeah. the economy. And when it was canceled, uh, it, it was like a gut punch for so many people. Yeah. Uh, it really killed them, you know. Um, anyways, uh, I want to ask about current projects. What do you have on the go right now, Robert? Anything we can uh, look forward to in the short term? Well, I'm starting my new project called Rich Entrepreneur, Poor Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the next take from Rich Dad because a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs. But what happens for most people that say they quit their job and they start a business, they go into a higher tax bracket. Mm -hmm. So they go from 40% taxes to 60%. So I'm going to talk about why some entrepreneurs get rich and why most don't. And um, so that's because we need more entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And the more entrepreneurs we have, the less people who are afraid of losing their jobs are. In other words, my company, my job is to protect my employees, not threaten them for speaking out or, you know, you 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 have to say this or I'll fire you and all this. Because as I said earlier, that's what really got my father. When he ran for lieutenant governor of the state of Hawaii, his best friends left him because they're afraid of losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. And you look at how many people are afraid of losing their jobs how much that affects their life because of job security or today with 401ks crashing or with, with this pensions crashing, we're in serious trouble. Yeah. So my work has gone up and it's, it's education. Behind me is a cash flow board game. And the reason I use a board game is because, you know, as Maria Montessori says, she's a great educational entrepreneur. She says, what the hand does, the mind remembers. So you're playing this game. It's, it's educating this great piece of real estate here, your left ear between your right ear. This is your greatest asset of all is your brain, but it's also your greatest liability without financial education. That's why my wife and I created the cash flow board game. So you can actually do. And when you're doing, you're learning more than just listening to a lecture. Mm -hmm. Well, anyways, Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. Really compelling conversation. It was good to get to know you better, get your perspective on so many relevant and timely issues. Thanks again. Thank you.